Hello and welcome to episode 176 of the official EstablishedRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I'm one of the co-founders here at ETR, as always, joined by fellow co-founder Evan Silva. And the NFL draft is just three short weeks away. Yes, we will be finding out where our favorite prospects will be playing for the next four to five seasons. But more importantly, most importantly, we can make money on being able to predict the outcome of the draft in the form of draft props to discuss that topic. We are joined by a very old friend of the show. It is, of course, Matt Friedman of the Action Network of Fantasy Labs. Matt, what's going on? It's great to be here. I mean, I always love talking with you guys in general, but uh, to talk about the NFL draft, which is, you know, like it's Christmas for me. Uh, it's thrilling to be here with you too. Yeah. I mean, I got to know Friedman as kind of a dynasty rookie draft virgin, and now he's turned into a props virgin. This is like, this is like the meeting of, of all worlds for Friedman. Evan, working on your mock draft, I believe, as we speak. What's going on, buddy? Yep, it should be out uh, no later than Monday. Uh, Friedman has been just a jack of many trades and, and master of many trades for a long time. Rotoviz OG. Um, just, you know, love listening to his podcast over on Action Network. He crushes it. He, he knows so much about so many different things. Um, he's going to put on a clinic here. We're just going to let him carry. I'm going to, I'm going to be riding on the coattails of Matt Friedman today. And I can't wait. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's more, it's more like I'm going to be the, the running back, uh, between the twenties and then Evan's going to just going to come in and, and, you know, it's like Jerome Bettis style and score like three touchdowns. <laughs> All right. I'll take that. Before we get into the show, I want to remind everyone to head to the site. Evan's mocks, as he said, will be up soon. Our best ball rankings are continuously updating. Leone and Herzig have strategy articles up. Silva's top 150 will be coming in the next month or so. It's all happening. All right. Let's start with some high-level strategy on the draft prop market. Because, Friedman, I think this is a unique market because it's one of the only ones that's not actually decided on the field, right? And actually, for that reason... It's not legal in some states. Here in Pennsylvania, it's not legal. I have to go over to New Jersey to put in my uh, draft prop bets. But this is a market that is weird because some people actually know the answer. Like, for example, Kyle Shanahan knows who the 49ers are taking at number three. This isn't like, well, you know, we'll see how it plays out on the field and, and rational people can disagree, you know. Evan and I can disagree about how good the Cowboys are going to be and, that, and, you know, that's fine. This is not that. This is a straight information game. There will be a right and a wrong answer and some people know the answer. And I find it fascinating because there's some element of understanding team needs. There's some element of understanding coaching and GM tendencies. There's player talent. There's information sources. I mean, it has it all. So, Friedman, what appeals to you about draft props and why do you find them so beatable, I guess. So, I, I mean, so many things to talk about. I mean, first of all, I just love the NFL draft. Again, I get more excited for that than the Super Bowl. Like you have the excitement of young guys entering the league. Every one of them thinks he's going to be a superstar, right? It's totally ridiculous. Uh, and yet each year it's so moving to see these guys achieve their dreams of being drafted into the NFL. So I like just the draft in general. I love the pomp and circumstance of it all. And even before I was a fantasy sports writer, uh, I just loved reading mock drafts. Uh, and I liked the mental puzzle of trying to think about where guys would land and you know what wait i just i just remembered something i have a story to tell that exemplifies the depth of my draft degeneracy uh i haven't thought about this in years okay i was a i was in a phd program at boston college i had already finished my classes and at that point uh, i was teaching classes and supposed to be working on my dissertation i had just gotten married this was almost exactly 10 years ago and we were living in new hampshire I was commuting back and forth to Boston two to three days per week to teach on a bus from Portsmouth to South Station, then, you know, taking the T, the subway system from there to Boston College. We're talking at least an hour and a half each way. So three plus hours of commuting each day, two to three days per week while I'm commuting. Instead of doing something useful, instead of researching for my dissertation and writing it, I am reading mock drafts, not for my job. I'm years away from having a job in sports media. I'm not even thinking about that. I'm thinking that I'm going to be a professor who teaches Shakespeare to college students. In the meantime, though, I'm a sports junkie who's mainlining NFL mock drafts hours at a time, multiple times per week. So this is 2011. There aren't many mock drafts available at that point. So pretty quickly, 
I move from mock drafts to draft prospect rankings, not fantasy rankings. I'm just talking about whatever random prospect rankings I could find on the internet for every position, offensive tackles, off ball linebackers, safeties, whatever. I was just randomly searching the internet for whatever prospect rankings I could find. Now, remember, I'm teaching classes. I have papers and tests I should be grading. The commute would be a great time to grade. Instead, I am taking spare blue books that students didn't use, and I start charting by hand in these blue books where all of the different prospects are ranked in these various positional rankings. And then with this information, I start to see like the general consensus ranking for each player. And then I start noticing outliers, right? I can see that this player was generally number one or two uh, in most rankings, but at this other site, he's number six. So then I start charting and keeping track of the outliers. I was a total freak. I was doing this for no reason. And then I, I checked the rankings later. Uh, and in my brain, I thought of this as sort of like gravity. Like that was the word I used. I would see if the consensus would eventually gravitate toward the outlier or if the outlier would gravitate toward the consensus. Uh, and I didn't have the vocabulary at the time, but that was my way of making a determination as to whether a certain, as to whether certain rankings were like sharp, you know? And so if the consensus gravitated towards the outlier, at least in my mind, that meant that that site or those rankings were pretty sharp. They, they were predictive, right? And then of course, once the actual draft happened, I would go back into these blue books and then I would chart to see which ones were accurate or which ones were predictive. Not that these rankings were saying that this is the order in which these guys will be drafted, but I figured that if there is no semblance of connection, if there's if there is no correlation between the rankings and what happened in the draft, then those those rankings were probably crap, right? And and at a minimum, they weren't predictive. Right. Again, I was doing this for no reason, just for the hell of it. It was like a compulsion because I love the NFL draft so much. So like, thank God I got this job. If I didn't, I would probably, I'd still be a random dude charting play, player rankings in blue books. Now I'm just a random dude, but I, I get paid and I chart my stuff in spreadsheets. Uh, that, that's a long answer. Uh, I guess the short answer is I like betting draft props uh, because I love the draft and I love betting props. So it's the, the perfect combination. But Adam, the stuff you talked about, uh, when you're setting up the question of like, there are so many different things that factor into this market. That is why it is so profitable. You know, like if you're me and you're a degenerate who loves thinking about mock drafts, I know way more than the average odds maker, lines maker, who doesn't think about this stuff except like one time per year. And so I'd say like, that is why I would have an edge. And then think about what it is that they have to do to even set a line. Like they're probably going to, I don't know, like the big names that work for big media companies. And they're looking at a couple of their mock drafts and then that's it. And like those, those analysts, I would say that they're probably very good at analyzing draft prospects uh, and, you know, thinking about how those guys might do in the NFL, but that's not the same thing as like predicting where those guys are going to go in the draft. So you have odds makers who are maybe looking at guys who really aren't all that good at doing mock drafts to begin with. And they're looking at just a couple, of them. So whenever they set these lines early on, those lines, sometimes they're not bad, but sometimes they can be really off. Yeah, for sure. And I think those are all, all good points. And I want to get into the who to listen to and who not to in a second here. I do want to say, you know, we're talking about how beatable this is. I want to give the same disclaimer that I gave when we talked about NFL player props, when we talked about NBA player props. We're not getting rich off this. There are extremely low limits on this stuff, you know, 100, 200, 500 dollars on a prop. And people say, you know, oh, why is it so soft? One of the reasons it's so soft is because there just aren't big limits on it. There's not a lot of liquidity in the market. But, you know, as we talked about a ton for people looking to merge from fantasy to sports betting, betting props is a huge, huge, huge way to do it. If you don't have if you have, you know, a reasonable bank and you're not looking to bet, you know, 1K a prop and stuff like that. OK, Evan, you are you have been extremely successful doing mock drafts over the last, I don't know what, three, four, five years, finishing at the top of these contests. Talk to the people about how you actually come up with your mock draft and who you think uh, who you think is best at mock drafting because a lot of this is going to be following mock drafts. We'll get into Freeman's process in a second here, but Evan, talk about how you do your mock draft and who you think is really good at doing mock drafts. Yeah, I had a really nice five-year run um, on uh, the Huddle Report 
And then last year I totally bombed it. I wrote on our site that I was going to bomb it. Um, and that's because <laughs> my process was thrown way out of whack with, you know, there was no pro day circuit. There was, you know, the, the combine happened, but it wasn't like the nor normal common people were talking about the virus at the combine. People were talking about uh, the CBA at the combine. It just, it was not the normal, you know, tons of information coming out of the combine. Um, and so, you know, and the, the B writers had less information and there was just le less information emanating. And so, um, I was not able to to have a, a successful mock draft year, but typically that's what it comes from. And this year we did have a major pro day circuit. We did not have a combine though. So I think we're still thrown off of the, the, the usual pattern, the, the usual off season, the, the course that the off season takes. And so I'm scared about having another bad mock draft, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to try my hardest and, and hopefully, I mean, see how, how the Hutter report scores is they will take your last five years. And so that bad score that I got last year is now going to be among my, 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 my cumulative for the, for the next five years. So I'm going to have to be working against that terrible score for the next half decade. I'm not excited about that. Okay. But who other than yourself would you think would be good off the beaten path people? Uh, do you think these, do you think these mock drafts from, I don't know, you know, McShay and Kuiper are, are worth looking at or who would you suggest people look at for the best mock drafts? Daniel Jeremiah is by far the best. Um, it was Mike Mayock for a long time. But now Daryl Daniel Jeremiah is like the absolute most plugged in dude, maybe next to like Schefter and, and Mortensen, probably just next to Schefter. Um, so Daniel Jeremiah stands like in a in a tier of his own. Now there are other guys like Peter Schrager, who I don't know if if he is the absolute best mock drafter, but when you look at his mock draft, if he has a dude in the first round that you don't see in other mock draft first rounds, take note of that because it's very likely that he uh, got like some uh, interesting nugget about that player. And um, like, you know, he, he has a valuable mock draft, not necessarily in terms of accuracy, although he has had some very good years in terms of accuracy. Um, but I would look in the second half of, of his mocks and look for guys that might stand out as outliers. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the mock drafts are, are just uh, group think. Um, mm -hmm. But then there are also guys that are able to think critically might not, you know, certainly don't have the, the networking capability of um, Daniel Jeremiah or, or even Peter Schrager, but guys that are just really good critical thinkers and Scott Smith, um, who, you know, long time wrote of as I think he's with action now, right? Yeah, 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 he's we, doing, we had, yeah, he's doing mock drafts at action and those are great. Yeah, I think we had him on the show last year. Yeah, we did. Uh, yeah. He, he's just like a really good critical thinker. And like last year, you know, the Miami Herald, the Palm Beach Post, um, you know, every newspaper that was covering the Dolphins uh, was like convinced that the Dolphins were going to pass on Tua. Scott Smith was able to critically think past that, had Tua at number five. And once you had Tua at number five, a lot of the other like pieces started to fall into place. And so Scott Smith is definitely another guy that I would, I would look at all his mock drafts. And then there have been just some guys that have been just super accurate for whatever reason. Ben Standig, um, is, he's been excellent. He actually worked at Roto World for a little bit back in the day. He, um, he's now, he now writes for The Athletic. He covers uh, the Washington football team, does a great job doing that. He's covered the Washington Wizards um, in the past. Um, I'm doing a podcast with him, I think tomorrow, uh, but he has just been flat out accurate for whatever reason, um, you know, probably due to critical thinking as well. Yeah. Freeman, anything you want to add on mock drafters? And also, is there like a, a data germ process we can do? Like, are you actually like creating a model of all these mock drafts and compiling them together? And how would you weight certain guys? Like if you think Jeremiah is the best, how would you weight in that model? Jeremiah's mock draft for somebody else. So Evan mentioned a lot of great people there. He's totally right about Daniel Jeremiah. He, he Jeremiah has been top 12 in the mock draft database competition each of the past three years. So like if, if Jeremiah says something, you should listen to him, not just because he's plugged in, but because he's very good at distilling the information he's getting into an actionable mock draft. Uh, as Evan said, Peter Schrager, uh, what I've noticed with Schrager is that he's not 
always accurate with his first or second mock draft, but like his final mock draft, like the day of that one tends to be pretty good. And Schrager was top 10 last year and, and Evan's right. Schrager like he will do some things, especially in the early ones. It's a little bit wild. And you think like, I don't know if that guy is going there, but like you should definitely pay attention to it because Schrager might be onto something. Um, yeah. And then Scott Smith, uh, obviously he's been top five each of the past three years. So I, I can't speak highly enough about what he does. He's just very good with his process of sifting through the noise, finding the signal, and then distilling that into something that's actionable. Um, Anthony Amico, who writes at four for four, I don't know if he officially releases mocks uh, or puts them in contest, but he posts his thoughts on Twitter. And I know that he is a very good NFL draft better. Uh, he's, he was the one guy I was routinely jealous of last year, whenever I would see where he had gotten some lines. And I was like, man, that was like, that was a good bet. I wish I had, I wish I had been sharp enough to get that a couple of days ago. Uh, and so anytime Amico posts anything on Twitter, uh, I definitely take notice of it because he tends to be ahead of line movement. Um, and then what I should say is, yeah, like I try not to overweight the influence of any one mock. So I try to look at all of them, track them. I've created an index of what I consider to be really sharp mock drafters. And so Evan mentioned the huddle report. There's also the mock draft database. They run a competition and then fantasy pros runs a competition. And all of them grade their mocks differently. So for instance, last year, I was number six in the Fantasy Pros mock. Uh, I wasn't nearly as good uh, in the competition for Huddle Report in Mock Draft Database. Um, you know, so I kind of take a sampling of people who do well across those three different competitions. I create an index and I use that collective information as a guide, right? I feel like in looking at, you know, like the sampling of like, let's say like 20 to 25 mocks, uh, you know, from historically accurate mockers, I get a sense of a range of outcomes, not to say that like what they say uh, is gospel, but like historically they've pointed in the right direction. And if I can look at Jamar Chase and like across these 20 drafts, he's going anywhere from number four to number seven, like that means he's got a really good shot of going in the top 10, you know, like anything random can happen. But if I at least have this information, I can use that when I'm making bets. And then also I use it to guide me, uh, you know, kind of like as a backbone for what I'm doing when I'm making my own mock drafts. Yeah. My concern there, and maybe you guys disagree, uh, is that a lot of these mocks are looking at each other. You know what I mean? Like when X mocker yeah. is making his mock, he's looking at Y mocker. So then you start to get like, like way worse group think than DFS. Like, yes. Then you just start to get incredible group think. And so everybody's afraid to put Jamar Chase at number 20. And so that's where I think you can get outliers coming to play. But a lot of these odds move based on these mocks and media speculations. So like, you know, there's definitely a chance for long shots. I know we had Clyde Edwards Alaire at 20 to 1 uh, to be the first running back off the board last year which was just like a ridiculous price on ngm and i want to get into you know why line shopping matters here in a little bit but i just wanted to point that out about other mockers looking at mockers when they make their mock like inception yeah, stuff that definite makes sense. echo chamber and so yeah. i do try to fight against it when i'm looking at the odds that are out there like subtracting like 10 15 percent of like what i think is sort of a realistic edge based on what i'm seeing in the index cool okay I want to keep talking about high level stuff, but I just want to talk for a second about this Mac Jones thing because I think it fits in the conversation of who should we be listening to in terms of reporters, not in terms of mock drafters, in terms of reporters. And so Evan's been skeptical. I've been skeptical. A lot of people have been skeptical that the 49ers would give up that much draft capital to take Mac Jones at number three overall. However, however, both Daniel Jeremiah and Adam Schefter, Jeremiah, obviously a reporter and a Mock drafter Schefter, obviously the nut high reporter, are saying with pretty good confidence that they think Mac Jones is going to be the pick at number three to Kyle Shanahan. So I, I don't know. I mean, he Mac Jones is up to minus two ten on FanDuel to be the number three overall pick. You know, on DraftKings you can get field, you can get Josh Fields plus two fifty to be the number three overall pick. That's tempting to me. However, I don't want to bet against Schefter and Jeremiah. So in the context of what reporters to listen to Friedman, how you digest this information reporters, how are you thinking about betting the number three overall pick? 
Yeah. Well, as you said, like Schefter, he's the best. He's the gold standard. And he frames his language so carefully and precisely. And he is so professional that he rarely gets bad information from a source. And he rarely overstates the certainty or reliability of the information he has. And I think it's worth, you know, Evan mentioned last year, there was kind of the debate about what the Dolphins would do at number five, whether it was Tua or whether it was Herbert. It's worth thinking about what it was that um, that Schefter said then when there was a lot of hype about Herbert. He was never adamant that it was going to be Herbert or that it was going to be Tua. What he said was, you know, based on what I'm hearing, it wouldn't be surprising if Herbert were the pick. There are a lot of teams that are high on him. He's going to go high in the draft. Tua is going to go high on the draft. If the Dolphins end up taking Herbert, that won't be a surprise. Now, like he ended up being right. Like in, in that language of what he said, like he was very accurate. He he never overextended himself. And you contrast that to what he has said about Mac Jones now, early on. He used that kind of hedging language shortly after the trade. He said, I wouldn't be surprised if it were Mac Jones, but just a couple of days ago on ESPN radio, he was asked, what do you think they do at number three? And the first thing he said, flat out said, it will be Mac Jones. (laughs) Schefter Schefter does not say something like that that's all you need yeah he does not say something like that unless it's like for him and his brain a hundred percent buttoned up and so then you have to ask yourself what are the odds that you think Adam Schefter is wrong like in a big spot like this what do you think the odds are that Schefter is wrong or like just imagine betting against Adam Schefter like I just I can't do that and then Independently, you have Daniel Jeremiah, totally different network, totally different process. You have him saying that from everything he's hearing, it's Mac Jones. So you put the two of them together. I think mine is, I mean, I got this at plus money, but I still think at minus 200. I mean, we can talk about this later. If, If you have faith in Adam Schefter, minus 200, that still seems like a decent price. Yeah, if you want to hear the Schefter interview thing for yourself, I retweeted it from, I believe Amigo had the tape and, and I retweeted it a couple of days ago. You can scroll back and find that if you want to hear what Schefter said for yourself. Evan, I know you were skeptical that 49ers would give up this much to get Mac Jones. I assume that your opinion has changed now that this is likely what how it's going to go and how surprised are you that San Francisco is going to go this route? Oh, I mean, I still think it strains logical belief that the 49ers would essentially give up surrender three first round picks and a third round pick to go draft dad bod Mac Jones over freaking Justin Fields and Trey Lance, who are both incredibly high ceiling prospects. It's still a strange logical belief, but when you have Adam Schefter, by the way, Adam Schefter is not just a great sports reporter. He's not just a great NFL reporter. He is the best reporter on the planet, like the best journalist on the planet. Uh, he, He doesn't miss. And you know, when, when he's telling you this and when and Daniel Jerry, it doesn't matter what you, you know, think is correct. Logically, you, you're running with this from a, when you're when you're trying to project the draft. So I think that we have the first three picks of the draft locked up and things start to get really interesting at number four with Atlanta, which we've heard rumors of them trying to move down. I think they should take a quarterback, especially if the 49ers are taking Mac Jones and Justin Fields. They have their pick of Trey Lance and, and Justin Fields. Uh, but I think that that's where the draft starts. All I need to hear is Daniel Jeremiah and freaking Adam Schefter telling me what's going to happen at number three, and we can move on to number four. Okay. And, and by the way, I, I agree with Evan that it, it's unfathomable that this is what's happening, but I, I do think it's what's happening. And Peter Schrager just today released his first mock draft, and he has Mac Jones going number three. Yeah. So, I mean, just more fuel on the fire there. Yeah, minus two ten again on on uh, on FanDuel for Mac Jones to be. I, you might be able to find better, and, and I, I actually wanted to bring that up because there is so much difference in lines across books. I mean, when we got the Ceh to be the first RB at twenty to one, he was like eight to one or six to one at other spots. And so if you go to books like some maybe uh, further books off the board like BetMGM, like points bet and you look at FanDuel versus DraftKings and stuff like that, you can find some crazy differences to ARB and you can actually find spots where you can bet the same prop and guarantee yourself 
to win money. So yeah, it's a lot of work to shop all these lines and stuff like that and be constantly doing it. But I would really recommend it to people. There's just, it's not like a normal NFL Sunday where you might find something a half point off or maybe a full point off if you're really lucky or, you know, the juice is different. These are massive differences. Freeman, talk to people a little bit about how you go about line shopping and the kind of differences you can find in these draft props. Yeah. So, I mean, as a company stand, uh, I should say that at Action Labs, we will be launching next week a, a product uh, that will sort through the lines from major sports books. So you can look at a prop and you can see immediately where the best line is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can also see where it is that we would be projecting it. So, you know, a streamlined version, I think that's the way to go. If you want to do it on your own, you know, right now, the books with the most robust markets are DraftKings and Foxbet, followed by BetMGM. So I would start with those. And then if you see a line you like, you can shop around. And then obviously you can check FanDuel, check points bet. But right now, those two books don't have super robust markets. Um, when lines are released, that is the time to bet them. You, you want the early lines. The mature markets tend not to offer as much value because they've been bet into place. And I would say the types of lines I would start with, the over-unders, both for individual players and for position groups. So for instance, over under 11 and a half for Devontae Smith's draft position or over under one and a half running backs in round one, you know, stuff like that. The over unders are a good place to start. And then also first player at a position. This type of bet is available at every book. Uh, I think there's some value in these bets. We can get into more of that later, but, you know, Adam, as you said, um, you know, there's a lot of value in line shopping. I think right now, some of the value tends to be on finding the best price for the favorites who are underpriced. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there might be some guys out there who are minus like 250 to be the first player off the board at a position. Uh, and really like, I might be thinking that there's like uh, an 80, 85% chance that this guy's the top player at his position. And so you can shop around and find, you know, a pretty good number where you're still having to lay some juice, but you're not laying as much juice, especially relative to the true odds of this guy being drafted the first at his position. So definitely shop around uh, and, you know, first player at a position that is really, I think, where it pays off to be shopping around because you can get a wide divergence in where these players are priced. All right. We've gone long enough here without giving the people some actual takes on this draft. So let's get into it here. I want to start with wide receivers. And so I, I'm sure you've seen this one, Friedman. Total wide receivers taken in round one. On DraftKings, they have it set at four and a half. How many wide receivers will be taken in round one? Over is minus 162. So I looked at a couple of mock drafts. McShay actually has six. Chase, Devontae Smith, Waddle, Tony, Terrence Marshall, Elijah Moore for a total of six. But, you know, and I could also, it, it wouldn't shock me if somebody took like Atwell or Rashad Bateman or Rondell Moore in the first round or something like that. But then Jeremiah only has four wide receivers in the first round. He has the guys that McShay has, but doesn't have tony and doesn't have marshall so how are you thinking about this one where there's kind of differentiation in, in the mocks but there's a lot of really good wide receiver prospects one thing i'll say about this is when there's a lot of prospects sometimes team at one position sometimes teams feel like they can wait they're like why would i take x guy in the first round if i can wait and still get a very 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 good prospect in the second round like whole position scarcity thing we talk about so much in fantasy but maybe that's assumption of rational gming anyway stream what do you think about this one total wide receivers taken in round one over under four and a half juices on the over Okay, so this is uh, an important one to line shop for because you actually can find this at five and a half mm -hmm. at uh, at Fox uh, Fox Bet and I believe at uh, Points Bet. So definitely shop around because if if you like the under, you know five and a half is a great way to go. The guys who are totally locked in to the first round: Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle. No question there. Um, I will be very interested to keep an eye on any news that breaks on the following players in terms of like news of them moving up draft boards, Terrace Marshall, Rashad Bateman, Kadarius, Tony, Rondell Moore, Elijah Moore, all five of those guys have gotten some round one hype. I've seen them in more than a few round one mock drafts. All of them had strong pro days and so if you think that there are already three of those guys locked in uh, with Chase, Smith, and Waddle, and you have five guys who have, you know, 
I'd say more than a 20% chance each guy to get into round one over four and a half doesn't look that bad uh, because I would say it's a coin flip right now with Rashad Bateman getting in and Kadarius Tony getting in. So if just one of those guys gets in and then you still have the other one out there, who's a coin flip plus five other guys who have a legitimate chance or three other guys who have a legitimate chance of getting in uh, and Terrace Marshall, especially after his pro day, his draft stock has really started to shoot up. Over four and a half doesn't seem bad. I have under five and a half right now that I bet uh, maybe like a week and a half ago. I'm starting to rethink that a little bit. I'm, I'm fine with the position of under five and a half, but over four and a half, that looks pretty good with all of the guys who do have a legitimate chance of getting in the first round. Yeah, you can also take, Evan, uh, odds to be first wide receiver taken. And I mean, the market is convinced it's going to be Jamar Chase. I mean, Jamar Chase, I've seen minus 450. I've seen minus 500. I mean, it's just, everybody just assumes it's going to be Jamar Chase. I don't know if you have any different feeling there, Evan, about who will be the first wide receiver taken. Because if you think it won't be Chase, which seems unlikely, but you can get really good prices on Devontae Smith or Waddle. What do you think about the first wide receiver off the board? Yeah, I mean, I think that they're, they're priced... Um... I think they're priced appropriately, but I think that if you were to take a chance on somebody, you go with a speed guy, uh, you know, and that's Jalen Waddle because teams can just become infatuated with uh, big time playing speed. Like Henry Ruggs, a lot of people didn't think that Henry Ruggs would be the first receiver drafted mm -hmm. last year. Um, he was right. Yeah, he was. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, speed guy. So um, I mean, not, not every draft is going to follow like that. And I, I think it's, I mean, what, 90% that, that it's probably Jamar Chase. But if you're going to take a shot on a longer shot guy, I think you go with a speed guy that's Jalen Waddle. Yep. Okay. Totally. Let's, just want to say, totally agree with that. And you can get Waddle right now at plus 800 at FanDuel. Yep. That's a pretty good number. Uh, I, as Evan said, I do think it's going to be chase. Uh, and I think you could actually, depending on where you shop around, you can bet, uh, minus three fifty right now on chase at bet MGM. I think there's probably some value in that number, but plus 800 on Waddle. I agree. If it's not chase, it is going to be Waddle, uh, and plus 800, the NFL has its fascination with speedsters. We have seen fast guys drafted as the top wide receiver, you know, like in each of the past five drafts. Uh, I think there's good value there. Yeah. And there's always a surprise. People are like, Oh my God, I can't believe they took John Ross at eighth overall. Oh my God. I couldn't believe that. Henry Ruggs was the first the first wide receiver off the board. Like these guys who run fast, man. I mean, yeah, the NFL teams get excited about them. But yeah, seems like almost certainly will be Jamar Chase, the first wide receiver off the board. And we'll talk about him more in a little bit. I was about running backs. So total running backs drafted in round one. I'm sure there's some one and a half lines out there on DraftKings. They have it set the over under at just a half. So will a running back go in the first round? Over is minus 225, under is plus 175. I think the main contenders here are Travis Entienne and Najee Harris. I know there's been hype about Javante Williams, but yeah, I, I mean, at plus 175, I think there's definitely a chance that teams do not, that nobody takes a running back in round one at all. Freeman, how have you thought about this one? How many running backs will go in round one? I think this one is about right uh, in terms of how it's priced. Um, in a lot of the mock drafts, I have seen one. Normally it's just one. Um, almost never, just in a couple of mock drafts, I've seen two. Most of the time it's one in a few. I'm saying like maybe like 10%, 15% have I seen zero. Um, and so I, I do think that we are likely to see one and that's the way that I would bet it. Um, I've taken a position on under one and a half. Um, cause that for me just feels like it's something that's pretty close to a slam dunk. I think it will be hard for them to get to, uh, in, in the first round, but where we are now at 0.5, uh, I think that's probably about right. Given the odds that you listed. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, these are luxury picks and Evan and I talked about this on, on the last podcast, you know, the dolphins, the bills, you know, maybe not for the dolphins, they do need a running back, but you know, I, I think that the dolphins are sharp enough and I think the bills are sharp enough. Maybe, I, I mean, in, in my opinion, hopefully not to do this. Evan, what do you think about the state of the running back position and how NFL teams are viewing them? Do you think NTN and Najee, is there any chance they both go or one, or maybe I, I like under a half or none? 
Yeah, last year I was on none. Um, and But then I was also on Clyde edwards Slayer to be the first running back drafted. So we got all that back in a hurry, you know. Um, so that's, that's kind of the approach that I'm going to take. I'm going to keep betting. I think the under one and a half uh, that, that Friedwin suggested is a great suggestion. Um, I'm going to keep trying to get the, the plus money, though. So I'm also going to have some some money on uh, on no running backs to be drafted at all in the first round. But I'm going to be trying to seek out a running back that is at, you know, at higher odds to be the first running back drafted. If we do get out of the first round with no running backs selected, I think it becomes even more of a little bit of a a wild, wild west situation where any of these running backs that are rated. There's just not that many good running backs, though, this year. I think there's really only like three maybe maybe four yeah well let me give you really good ones yeah let me give you the market so on FanDuel yeah. right now odds to be first running back taken Najee Harris is minus 140 Travis Etienne is plus 150 Javante Williams plus 380 and Kenneth Gainwell mm. 10 to 1 plus a thousand and so mm. you know you're not getting these huge prices like you were before and to Etienne and Javante aren't that big of odds but yeah i mean it's close i don't think there's like a huge consensus over who's the yeah. best back in this class between Najee and tn and i know javante has been making a, a push lately yeah. so yeah i don't know if you have any takes there what, what about gainwell friedman he sounds he sounds real i haven't seen him yet but i he sounds really interesting yeah i mean he was super electric his one year in college um but didn't do anything uh you know because last year he opted out but he's gotten like no hype uh, in terms of like having a real chance of being the number one pick. I would be really, or the number one back. I'd be surprised if he even goes in round two, Uh, round three at the highest seems like where he would be going. Javante Williams is a guy who's interesting in that his draft stock has steadily increased over the past year. And then after his pro day, where, you know, he exhibited NFL level athleticism, you know, clocked in at 212 pounds, you know, 4.55. That's not great, but it's like, it's not bad. Like he, he looks like an NFL back. Um, his draft stock has started to go up, but I still haven't seen him in a single uh, mock in round one. And uh, I mean, I think Etienne and Harris are so far above him just in terms of the, the hype that they have, that it would be incredibly surprising if a team goes with Williams over one of them. So yeah. I don't really see much value in the market right now on, uh, on Harris, sorry, on, uh, on Williams. I actually see a ton of value in the market on Etienne, uh, depending on where you're looking. Like I saw him this morning at plus 225, mm-hmm. I believe at uh, points bet. And like, yeah. that is just a fantastic number. Yeah. So well, and uh, he, he cl- also seems like flip. a player. He also seems like a player that a team could justify to, to itself. Um, Hey, you know, we're not just taking a running back. We're taking a playmaker, you know? Yeah. And so, um, because I mean, he's like an electrifying playmaker, you know, or at yeah. least he was in college. So and he they, was they a great could, receiver. So they yeah, can kind of right. rationalize it that way that he's a complete player who helps them in both phases. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of thinking ETN, uh, number one yeah. running back at anywhere from plus 150 to plus 225, obviously plus 225 preferable. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And when these situations come up, you think it's kind of like a coin flip and this could change obviously, but you know, you can only bet with information. It doesn't mean you can't bet more later if you get new information and move in and out of positions, as long as you're getting really good numbers with each one. Uh, I think that makes sense at all. Uh, totally. Okay. Freeman mentioned these, uh, uh, players to go first at a position when you're laying huge wood. So like you have to lay to get uh Penny Sewell to be the first offensive lineman. Uh, you have to lay, I don't know. I, I saw a minus 615 out there. I, I, I don't know what, what it's out there. What else is out there right now? Micah Parsons to be the first linebacker taken. Shout out Penn State. He's minus 400. You know, I understand people don't want to lay this kind of wood. It's not fun to lay this much wood. It doesn't mean that it can't still be a good bet. In other words, it can still be underpriced, even if you're laying minus 400 or minus 600. Now, I will note, as we talk about offensive linemen, Friedman, is that Jeremiah does not, in his latest mock, does not have Penny Sewell as the first offensive lineman off the board. So what do you think about that? And if you think that's the case, I mean, there's got to be some huge prices. on. So I, I, I forget the other dude's name. Uh, Slater. Sean Slater. Yeah. But I mean, there's got to be some huge prices on him out there. So what do you think about that? Yeah. So, and I'll just say Peter Schrager also just in his mock today had Rashawn Slater 
going ahead of Sewell, which at this point just gives me a heart attack. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, you know, what's, what, uh, what Schrager is saying is that, you know, a few teams have told him that they have Slater ahead of Sewell. Now, I mean, who knows? Maybe those aren't teams in the top 10, but, you know, Schrager doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Uh, and so this is something I really need to start paying attention to. But, you know, like everyone, like, and I'm just talking about like mock drafters, but, you know, like uh, scouting services, they have Sewell ahead of Slater. Uh, and so I'm I'm not going to make any more investment at minus 715 or uh, my, yeah, uh, just because of Jeremiah and Schrager, because that does, that does legitimately scare me, but you know, there are other players out there. You mentioned Micah Parsons, you can bet him uh, minus 350 at bet MGM total stud linebacker can do it all big and ran like a sub point four, four forty time. Uh, everyone has him going like literally everyone has him going as the number one linebacker off the board, you know, at PFF uh, at sports info solutions at the draft network, he's easily ranked as the number one linebacker. And, you know, I would say he has like an 85, 90% chance of being the number one off ball linebacker selected. And so to be able to get him at minus 350, I still think there's some value there. It's not like it's, it's not a sexy bet, you know, cause you're not going to make much money on it, but like, I think that's still a pretty good value seeking bet, even though it's so much juice. Yep. I'm, I'm, I'm firing some off here while we're doing this. Uh, so <laughs> I gotta, I gotta ask you, uh, Friedman, um, I, cause I didn't see Schrager's mock. Are are they putting uh, Rayshon Slater at number five to the Bengals? Number six to the Dolphins. Okay. Okay. And the thing is, you got to think, I mean, they, the Dolphins did draft multiple offensive linemen last year, last year multiple right. tackles, you know, in the yeah. first round. And then and I think Austin once Jackson again did in the well. second round. He had, he had like yeah. a high PFF rating. Um, well, I'm just, cause I'm looking at right now, first non quarterback to be drafted. Rayshon Slater, 16 to one. Yeah. I mean, and and so if we get quarterbacks at one, two, three, four, which I think we should, whether or not the Falcons trade mm-hmm. out, and then if the Falcons do trade out, then I think we definitely get quarterbacks one through four. Mm-hmm. Then we're at number five with the Bengals. And I don't know. I I know some people say Kyle Pitts, Jamar Chase for them, but man, they need offensive line help big time. Yeah. yeah. And so if- I don't know. Yeah. If I, if I was the Bengals, I would go offensive line for sure. I mean, protecting Joe Burrow would be like by far my number one priority. But for what it's worth, Jeremiah has Pitts going five, Jamar Chase number six to Miami, Fields number seven to Detroit. And then at eight, at eight, Jeremiah has the Carolina Panthers taking Rashawn Slater and then nine, Penny Sewell to the Broncos. And so, yeah, I, I mean, to get those prices, I think you can get plus 350, plus 400 on Slater to be the first offensive lineman off the board. I think that's interesting. Uh, at a minimum, just based on what we've said about Jeremiah so far. Okay. What about first defensive player taken, period? I think this is pretty close. Most books have it between Parsons and Sertain. Have you looked at that one? Friedman, I know uh, Quiddy Pay, I hope I'm saying that right, is in the mix, and J.C. Horn maybe uh, as well. Have you thought at all about first defensive player taken? That one is pretty split between uh, Sertain and Parsons. And so I, uh, I haven't taken a position on that yet. I think it's, I think it's pretty close to a toss up. And so if you wanted to say, okay, plus 150 plus 150 at DraftKings for both of those guys, and you're, you know, relatively sure it's going to be one of them, you know, maybe you lock in a a profit there, but I don't know if it's, uh, quite that clean. So, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not really taking a position on that one either way because there is a chance that yeah. it's uh, Quiddy Pay or that J.C. Horn slips in there. So I don't have a bet on that. Yeah, and, and a lot of these spots, if you, th- if you don't have a take, that's okay. Like if you're paying attention to Twitter, you you have notifications on like I do and 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 you get some information from Schefter or Rap Sheet or whoever you like or Jeremiah or whatever. I mean, you can bet before they take these lines down. It's not like the NBA where you literally have like 20 seconds to bet once an injury happens before they take the line down. This is These will be up uh, for a little bit longer than that. 
Um, we haven't talked about quarterbacks at all because obviously, you know, it, everybody assumes it's going to be Trevor Lawrence. He's like minus 6,000 on FanDuel to be the number one overall pick. Zach Wilson is like, you know, minus 1050 on FanDuel, minus 2,000 on DraftKings to be the number two pick. We already talked about the number three pick. Is there anything else on quarterbacks you want to mention? Friedman, the over under, I believe it's like five and a half on DraftKings, but yet it's under is minus 500. So like you have to lay so much wood on the under five and a half on quarterbacks. Do you have any other bets on the quarterback position? I mean, we're, uh, I mean, I don't know, like there's, there's a study that was pretty good that shows that um, the one position that is routinely over mocked is quarterback. And so, you know, maybe I shouldn't be quite so confident that we're going to see five quarterbacks in the first round, especially because, you know, like you almost never see five quarterbacks in the first round. That said, I'm pretty confident we're seeing five quarterbacks in the first round. And so if you wanted to bet, in that way, I mean, to, to put this differently, all of the mock drafts I've surveyed, the sharp mocks, all of them have five quarterbacks going in round one. And a lot of them have, you know, five quarterbacks going in the top 12. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think there's an excellent chance we do get five quarterbacks in round one. I don't believe we will get six because that's just like the 1983 class like the all-time great quarterback class of that year they had six quarterbacks like i don't i don't think we approach that but i do think we get five uh justin fields i mean trey lance i think he's a really intriguing fantasy prospect for sure and maybe real life prospect especially because he's so young but i do think that justin fields is the superior player uh multiple seasons of great production and he was right there with trevor lawrence as like the one one a uh, high school recruit coming into college. And I don't think Fields did anything in college to make you think that he can't have a strong NFL career. So you can bet the over under for him at uh, three and a half, sorry, at four and a half, at four and a half. And as, as Evan said, you know, there's a pretty good chance, whether it's the Falcons staying at number four or it's a team trading up to number four, there's a pretty good chance that he will be the number four pick or that a quarterback will go at number four. And so if you're really interested in Justin Fields, you can bet on the under four and a half at plus one Oh five at DraftKings. And I, I haven't bet that yet. I might bet it now, but, um, and and, you know, in the most recent mock draft I have, I, I have the Falcons going with Kyle Pitts at number four, but I'm not, I'm not at all convinced of that. I, ultimately, I do think it probably will be a quarterback. So with yeah. that in mind, Justin Fields under four and a half at plus 105. I think there's some value there. Yep. Okay. Let's move on to listener questions because I think that uh, blends in well to our first listener question here. It comes from BL's Ebub. He says, we're assuming the first five picks are quarterbacks, right? He says, Bengals trade out with some GM who's desperate to get two more years on the job. No. So what he's suggesting here is that the Falcons take a quarterback and then the Bengals trade out of their spot to somebody who wants a quarterback too. And so he's suggesting it goes something like Lawrence, Wilson, Mac Jones, Justin Fields, Trey Lance in that order. I mean, that would seem crazy to me. I doubt, I don't think we've ever, I mean, almost certainly have never had five quarterbacks to go in the first five picks of the draft. Evan, how much would it surprise you if the Bengals moved out of that number five spot and traded it to a team who wanted one of uh, Trey Lance or Justin Fields, whichever one is left? Well, I think that that's how the draft should go. I think that the the quarterbacks, um, you know, should all go one, two, three, four, five. I mean, I think that they're all that good of prospects. This has been the position that I've studied the most so far. Um, and I, I think they're all excellent prospects. I mean, they're obviously Trey Lance, you know, with the shortage of experience, you know, you can hold that against him. The, the weird sort of aura around Justin Fields, which I don't really understand, but there have been enough people that are saying like, oh, some people have Justin Fields graded in the fourth round, you know, the, the, the dad bod for Mac Jones. Um, but ultimately, I mean, these guys are clearly really good prospects at the most important position in pro sports. And I think they should go one, two, three, four, five, but to forecast that, you know, I think it's probably maybe four to one that 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 would actually happen just because trades down. I mean, teams want a lot of compensation for trades down uh, in the draft, especially that high up. And, you know, you're banking on two trades down at uh, number four and number, well, potential trade down at number four. And then, a, a almost certain trade down at number five, uh, if, if that's how you want to project it again. I think that that's how it should go. But to project that, I mean, that's that's quite a leap of faith. 
Yeah. I mean, Freeman, if you were to do that, if you were to actually project that, I'm sure you get some absurd numbers. And as we get closer to the draft, I'm sure some books will offer things like pick the first four picks in order, pick the first five picks in order and stuff like that. What do you think about the chances we get five quarterbacks to start the draft? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Evan's right in terms of kind of like uh, handicapping the the odds of that happening. I wouldn't assume that that's how it works out because the teams that need a quarterback, it's a pretty significant move up for them to go to number four or number five. I, I'm not going to assume that they have to pay exactly what the 49ers paid, but it's still going to be pretty close to what the 49ers paid. And I just don't see multiple teams wanting to do that uh, for a guy who at that point will be like the fourth or the fifth quarterback off the board, even if they do like the guy a lot. So I'm not expecting it to happen. Okay. Question two comes from Christian. He says, what are your guys' thoughts on grabbing Penny Sewell draft position over five and a half at plus odds? I don't know if that's still out there. Freeman can tell us, but he says, Christian says, I know he is the best lineman and I've already bet on him to be first offensive lineman taken, but quarterback should be one through three. And I think there's a solid chance ATL goes quarterback or trades out to get a quarterback at four and then pits and chase and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I mean, is this actually out there? Can you actually get Sewell over five and a half at plus odds right now, Freeman? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. DraftKings over five and a half plus 110. Wow. And so assuming Jones goes number three, right? Picks four and five will likely come down to Fields, Pitts, Chase, and Sewell with a shot of Trey Lance as well. So at plus money, uh, definitely, I think there's value there in over five and a half. Yeah, I like that too. I mean, especially with what we've seen out of the Latest mocks and yeah, if you're and also if there's some debate that Penny might not even be the first. Exactly. I mean, if you yeah. already took Penny to be the first offensive lineman, you can definitely hedge with over five and a half at the same time, and maybe you can end up hitting both. You know, it's that that's certainly possible. Yeah, I think that's sharp Levitan. Yeah. Question three from Nathan. He says, "What's good, gents? What's good, Nathan?" He says, "Waddle before Chase, Darisaw before Slater, Horn before Certain." NTN before Harris, which is least most likely. We already talked about NTN and Harris. We both thought it was good value. If you can get plus 225 NTN over Harris. We haven't talked about the other ones. Oh, we talked about Waddle before Chase a little bit. What about these other ones he's asking about? Freeman, Darisaw before Slater and Horn before Sertain. Yeah, Darisaw before Slater. I think there's almost no chance that this happens because now you have, you know, Sharps, Schrager, and Jeremiah talking about Slater before Sewell. Yeah. Uh, not in one mock have I seen Darisaw before Slater. Darisaw is more of like, you know, starting at pick 15. You know, I think that's where he would maybe start to come into play. And with Slater, I would expect that there's a pretty decent chance he's off the board before pick 15. So I think that's the one that is least likely to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that certain goes before horn, but horn had a a great pro day. Uh, And so he has started to see his draft stock rise and Caleb fairly, who had a pretty good chance of at one point being the number one corner. uh, He had back surgery. And so his draft stock has declined. And so horn has kind of moved up the board to take the spot of the guy who might compete with Sertain to be number one. So I think there's a chance that it happens, but I would still give Sertain probably like a 60 to 70% chance of being the number one cornerback selected. Okay. I think that makes sense. Question four. I think this is a good one for Evan. He's from Patrick. He says, what's the over under on Dolphins trades involving a first round pick one nap? I don't think it's the thing you can bet, but I still think it's interesting to talk about because the Dolphins obviously are absolutely loaded with draft capital. We know they're not afraid to make moves. Evan, are you expecting the Dolphins to be active in the first round, moving around a bunch of their picks come draft day? I don't know. It's tough to say, man. It's tough to say right now. I don't really have any big takes on trades that are going to happen in the draft, I mean, until like literally the day before the draft. Yep. And even then, I don't feel great about it. So well, projecting uh, draft day trades is one of the most difficult things, um, you know, to, 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 to pin down. Yeah. I mean, the Dolphins have the number six pick and number 18. I yep. mean, I know people are saying they should take a running back at 18. I mean, I really hope they don't do that. Uh, but... People have been saying the Dolphins should take a running back since yeah. literally Mark Ingram came out of Alabama. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. He was – yeah. Everybody thought he was going to uh, the Dolphins at number fifteen or that or number five or some I don't know something crazy, really high that that year. But no, I mean they have resisted that, and I, I mean and now they're even a smart, a much more smarter organization yeah. now than they were then. So um, yeah. 
All right. You want to say anything there, uh, Freeman, or should we go to question five? Yeah, quick quick point on what Evan said. Uh, one of for me, one of the the signs of someone, especially in their final mock, that this person has no idea what they're doing is if they're projecting a lot of trades. Because like it's hard enough to project what happens if everything goes right, but then trying to uh, really outline the way in which chaos will unfold, yeah. it's like man, there's there's no way you can do that accurately. So I really don't even try to get too much into the trades that might happen. I just try to get you know some baseline level of accuracy but but to address this question directly i'll take the under on one and a half <laughs> trades know. involving the dolphins yeah. yeah i wish we could bet that but i don't think there's actual market for that okay the uh, worst mock drafts that i've ever put out have been ones where i try to project trades yeah. like the eagles trading up for Mariota. i mean that was a disaster <laughs> yeah i mean it's the same concept as picking upsets in the NCAA tournament you know they're going to happen but identifying them is way right. harder than people yeah. than people realize yeah. Yeah. um okay question five from kyle who says will pitts go before chase will pitts go before jamar chase and so we're going to talk more about prospects next week and leading up to the draft and everything obviously there's a lot of outlier stuff to talk about you know we've talked plenty and the data backs it up that uh early round tight end is shaky because the data is very clear that tight ends are often not successful to their second contract. Now, I'm no scout, but everybody is telling me this Kyle Pitts kid is just absolutely off the wall, outlier, can't miss. I mean, tight end at four is, I mean, just mind blowing to me. But again, I'm no scout. Freeman, what do you think about this tight end going before Jamar Chase and people projecting Kyle Pitts to actually go fourth overall? Yeah, so that would be the highest in NFL history that any tight end has ever gone. The uh, current record holder is Mike Ditka, Hall of Famer, who still might be the greatest tight end of all time, right? He went number five. But, um, you know, for Chase, uh, sorry, for Pitts to go number four, uh, I mean, that would just be mind blowing. But at the same time, you know, we have seen very few tight ends who have his physical capability, like Vernon Davis comes to mind vernon davis went number six uh very few tight ends with his physical capability and then also his receiving production on top of it so you will see guys who are just freak athletes but don't have the production and you'll see guys who have the production but not the athleticism and so for pitts to have all of that in one package and then for you to kind of be able to see like yeah he's got a real shot of going anywhere from number four to number 10 you know he also won the mackey award okay Mm -hmm. Yes. Can we not Evan, leave that out of our analysis Evan, here? Evan, not just the Mackey Award, the motherfucking Mackey Award. Okay? <laughs> and you you are going to like this, right? Degenerate that I am, I have actually tracked um, awards like this to see which ones, if you put them into a model, actually have any sort of predictiveness. Okay. The Bolitnikoff doesn't, the Davy O'Brien doesn't, the Doak Walker doesn't, but the motherfucking Mackey award (laughs) that actually has predictiveness. If you put that into a model, not like massive predictiveness, but all things equal. If you have a third round tight end who doesn't have the Mackey, and then you have a third round tight end who does that guy is going to outperform like adjusted for everything else. So yeah, he won the Mackey and Evan, not just, just the Mackey. He's the first tight end in in history who was actually a finalist for the Bolitnikoff. You know, like oh, that's how goodness. good that he was in college as a receiver that they were like, this guy, he should be a finalist for the Bolitnikoff. So, I mean, he is like a legit once in a generation type of tight end prospect that we will see. Uh, so that, Producer Lou, got to gotta clip that one. Got to clip that one. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, did so, you? Did you? By the way, I wanted to ask you this though. Staying on the same topic, did you yeah. ever look at SEC Defensive Player of the Year? No, uh, I never did. Okay, all right, because th- th- those have been pretty pretty good. But go. go okay, ahead. that's that's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, but coming back to the question of like pits before Chase, you do have in pits this guy who is uh, in terms of the production and the athleticism unlike any tight end we have seen for at least the past 20 years, probably longer. Uh, And so I could see how he goes ahead of Chase because as great as Chase is, like there will be another receiver like Chase who comes along in the next two to five years. You know what I mean? Like Pitts is unlike something that we've seen before. That said, I think it's a coin flip. Like I really do think it's a coin flip. Yeah. 
Man, I, you know, Evan just gets, he, see, that's the thing, Freeman. Evan doesn't need a model. He just gets it in his gut and he says motherfucking Mackie Ward. And then the nerds go and, and back test it. And it turns out that he's right. You know what it's, I mean? It's, it's legit. <laughs> the Mackie Ward, that is the one award where it's like, I don't know, that guy won the Mackie. Yeah. Yep. All right. Last question we're going to do today comes from Jeff. And I was interested in this too. Jeff says, why did Matt leave the adventurous state of Iowa? Yes, Matt was located in Iowa. He has since relocated to Minneapolis, Minnesota. Imagine turning your back on the great state of Iowa, Friedman. What's going on? Yeah, why would anyone leave the state where Field of Dreams uh, originated? I don't know why anyone would do that. I mean, I, the reason why anyone does anything, you know, like I'm, I'm married, you know, uh, that's why I lived in, in New Hampshire uh, to begin with. You know, my wife, she was a grad student at UNH. And then after she graduated, I followed her for her job to Colorado. And then from there to Iowa and now Minnesota. I mean, a hundred percent, wherever I live next, it's going to be because I'm following her, you know? <laughs> well, congrats on the sex then, buddy. That's amazing. Uh, okay. Adam, said I, I said, I said I'm married. <laughs> Big <laughs> assumption. <laughs> all right. We've said it all. We probably said too much. Friedman, tell the people where they can find you, where they can find your draft props, where they can find you on social, et cetera, et cetera. So you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Matt F. The Oracle. Uh, I think that in the Action Network app, uh, maybe starting next week, there's talk that we will have draft uh, draft picks in there, like the draft props in there. So you can track that. And if we do have that, uh, my picks will be in the app. I'm also writing a lot of uh, draft prop and prospect profiles uh, at Action Network. And so you can check that out there. And then, of course, mock drafts. Uh, I will have mock drafts coming out, uh, you know, maybe two or three more before the day of the actual draft and the same with scott smith uh he's got a great draft uh mock draft at action network and he's going to have another one coming out uh maybe a day or two before the actual draft so all of that you can find at action network all right beautiful thank you so much i think we learned a ton here you guys stay on top of the draft props leading up to it evan i'll be back next week to continue to preview the upcoming nfl draft stay tuned to the site for evan's mock and our continuously updating best ball rankings for Friedman, for Silva, for producer Luke. I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.